Welcome to Cyclopod, showcasing work by early career geoscientists that is of interest to the cyclostatigraphic community. This podcast is made possible thanks to financial support of the International Subcommission on Timescale Calibration. Hi there and welcome to Cyclopod. This is the 14th episode and this time around we're going to do something special. This episode revolves around the EGU23 conference that took place in Vienna in April 2023. My co-host Anna Jordruri and myself attended this conference and we interviewed five early career researchers that had a poster with a Milankovic forcing topic. So I'd suggest we dive right in with an interview of Loïc Sablon, PhD student at the University of Louvain in uh, Belgium. And Loïc was presenting some Devonian climate and carbon cycle simulations that showed a peculiar response of the carbon cycle, more specifically organic carbon burial, in response to astronomical forcing. Let's hear what he has to say about that. Uh, yes, so my name is Rick Sablon. I come from Belgium. I'm working under the supervision of Michel Crucifi on the ocean uh, anoxic events during the Devonian. Brilliant. Do you mind sharing a little bit about your poster that you're showing here at EGU? Uh, yes, so I made a poster for the EGU where I show what is the workflow and the model chain I'm using uh, in order to uh, simulate an ocean anoxic events during the Devonian. And, uh, yeah, what was the main result, what was the main outcome that you found? In my poster, I'm showing uh, a time series where there is a, a peak in the carbon barrier, but this is something that I still have to <laughs> to figure out why there is this peak. So it might be interesting. Oh, but clearly some uh, really uh, hot off the press science then. Yeah. So, <laughs> wonderful. And how have you found your, is this your first EGU? How have you found it? Uh, yes, it's my first EGU since uh, it's my second year in this uh, in this field because before I was in cosmology, uh, so nothing related, and it's, it's really great to be there. Uh, it's really huge. <laughs> I didn't know that it was so huge and so many people, but it's great. Brilliant. And any great science highlights you think that you enjoyed seeing today? In the morning, I spent uh, watching. All the talk from the climate of the past with uh, the orbital fencing, and they were all very interesting. Uh, I particularly enjoyed one from uh, Nina, <laughs> which is uh, closely related to, to, to my work. And, yeah, I took some notes and, uh, and I processed it later, but they were all interesting. And, and in the afternoon, uh, I took a, a small break uh, and visited a small uh, the, the stands and, and some other talks. Brilliant. Okay, um, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your EGU. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Loic, for also advertising uh, the work of my PhD student, Nina Wichen, who presented a cyclostatigraphic study of a frenian femenian boundary section in the Rhenish Massif in Germany. For the next interview, we will leave the Devonian and we go even further back in time to the Cambrian with Valentin Jamar. Valentin is a PhD student in Lausanne, and Valentin presented a poster on a core, a sediment core from Sweden that he XRF scanned at a resolution of one millimeter. And on top of that, he also presented some carbon isotope chemostratigraphy with some major swings in that isotope ratio and some uranium lead ages that could help in anchoring that floating astrochronology uh, of the Cambrian. So let's hear what Valentin has to say about all that. I'm standing here with uh, Valentin Jamar from the University of uh, Lausanne in Switzerland, and he's just presenting a poster on Cambrian cyclostatigraphy. Valentin, can you say a few words about yourself and why you are fascinated by an interval of time in the geological history that is as old as the Cambrian? <laughs> Yes, yeah, so uh, thank you, thank you, David. So yeah, as, as I said, I'm uh, I'm Valentin Jamar. I'm uh, I'm a PhD student at the at the University of Lausanne, and uh, the Cambrian is uh, is very fascinating because uh, a lot of very important and major events occur, like the the radiation of animals, uh, the and many 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 other stuff. Like there is also a lot of uh, 
biogeochemical uh, event that occurred during this period. And I think that better understanding what's happened there, it's really, really important. Yeah. And so I've seen you have different uh, geological records on your poster. Where, where did you take the samples? Yeah, so for the for the poster here, it's a it's a it's a drill core from uh, from Sweden that I that I have studied, but I have also studied in uh, in my first year of the PhD an outcrop in uh, in southern France and uh, and another outcrop in the in the desert of, of Utah in the US. Wow, cool! And have you uh, been on the field yourself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For Montagne Noire, so in southern France, for Utah, I went on the field, but for the core of Sweden. The core has already been drilled. Yeah. I receive it in Lausanne, and then I send it. I send it to, to Sweden to scan it. I went to Sweden to, to be able to scan it, and then I send it back to uh, the Danish team that have uh, called. Uh, Excellent. So I've seen uh, many different proxies on your uh, poster: TOC, calcium carbonate content, um, delta 13C of organic matter. But what stick to my mind is the one millimeter resolution you have on the core scans, the XRF core scans. Uh, why is it uh, reasonable to do such a high resolution scanning? The sedimentary rate is relatively low because it's uh, it's shale from bassinal environment. Uh, one millimeter, it's uh, it's relatively okay to have enough data and data points to after that perform uh, cyclostratigraphy and be able to, in the best case, uh, tracking the precession cycles. Yeah, exactly. And you don't have bioturbation to worry about, right? <laughs> yeah, no, there is not much bioturbation. There is just two small layers that have been a bit eroded, okay. so perhaps 2,000 years have been missing, but uh, usually, you know, it's uh, very like a black shale, so it's, uh, it should be really nice. With Thank you, Valentin. And, so yeah. and good luck with the poster and with publishing all your results. Yeah, th th thanks a lot, and uh, finger crossed. <laughs> yeah, cool. That was Valentin Jamar. We continue with Peng Zhu. Peng is a PhD student from Beijing, and at first, when we asked her to be interviewed, she was very hesitant and very shy. But in the end, we were able to convince her. And I am very, very happy about that and very proud about Peng finding the courage to present her work here at Cyclopod. So on her poster, Peng was showing um, model simulations um, simulating the East Asian winter monsoon in response to insulation changes and changes in Arctic sea ice. And she could clearly show that this East Asian winter monsoonal system had been strengthening in response to a steeper temperature gradient between the latitudes. Peng, the floor is yours. So would you like to introduce yourself? Okay, my name is Zhou Peng and I'm from China. What, where do you work? Uh, I work in um, Institute of uh, Earth Environment, uh, Chinese Academy of uh, Science, and uh, Beijing Normal University. Okay, and are you doing your PhD? I'm a PhD student. Okay, and uh, who are you? Who are you working with on your PhD project? This poster, uh, I focus on the uh, changes of East Asia monsoon since the Holocene. That's wonderful. And what uh, what type of methods did you use to work on? What type of techniques did you use? I used the simulation model uh, CESM. What was the main result that you came out uh, with your with the simulation? What did that show? We find uh, uh, the East Area Winter Monsoon show an increasing trend since the mid Holocene. Oh, wonderful. That's great. And have you enjoyed EGU so far? Yes. Is this your first EGU? Or? Yes. Wow. This is my first time to EGU. I think uh, the conference is very interesting and I want to join uh, the next time. Oh yeah, Peng. We're all looking forward already to EGU 2024. Hope to see you there. We continue with Miho Ishizu. She ran the Community Earth System model over the uh, Pleistocene, over the last 3 million years. And um, she fed that community Earth system model result into CGNI to understand how the global carbon cycle responds to Milankovitch forcing. Good afternoon, Michal. Very nice to meet you here at uh, EGU 23. I had a look at your poster, which is on uh, Pleistocene simulations with CGNI. Uh -huh. So you're simulating um, the climate and the carbon cycle. Yeah. 
what is your main result? Ma, uh, we now we did, uh, still ongoing, but now we developed a new model to to assess the carbon cycle variability during the uh, Pleistocene. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, cool. And so, do you confirm like the general view that during the Pleistocene glaciers, mm -hmm. most of the CO2 is stored in the deep ocean of the southern hemisphere, or? Uh, so um, our model is um, for three million year simulation by using the CO2 forcing uh, from the flavor and the ice sheet and the Milankovic cycle. Yeah. And then uh, we can get a more realistic uh, temperature and salinity and also saturation. Okay. And we input the, uh, this temperature and salinity to the CG. Uh, and the CG is, uh, is kind of the system model and we input everything. The atmosphere module, uh, land, land module, ocean circulation module, and ocean sediment module. And so to do that, uh, we evaluate the uh, carbon cycle uh, under the realistic ocean circulation. Yeah. And so I see you have a transient run of 3 million years. How long does it take to run that? Yeah, so that is a problem. So yeah. <laughs> that, that's why the list is ongoing and also that we need to some tune of the spin up. Yeah. So it, it takes time, yeah. but uh, maybe we, we separate some chunk, probably in future. Yeah. But still, we need to some uh, try. So you don't have the, three, the full 3 million years yet? Yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah. So okay, it's cool. Really, yeah, it's difficult to run the model for 3 million years. Yeah. So we probably change some strategy and uh, make us some chunks. And did you get some useful feedback on your poster from people? Oh, yeah, some people who use the uh, CGE, they can visit our, our poster and also some uh, researcher uh, interested in the carbon cycle, they visit uh, my, my page. My yeah, poster. cool. And are you enjoying the conference? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah, very nice. Did you see some good talks? Yeah, yeah. So I'm, uh, my background is not a uh, uh, paleo climate. But, yeah. uh, now, uh, but I still have the background of the ocean circulation, the physics and the carbon cycle. That's why I went to the some session relating to the Milankovic uh, cycle this time. And I'm, I'm learning now. Yeah, thank you. And keep on learning. <laughs> thank you for your time. Last but not least, we go to the Eocene. One of my favorite time periods in geological history, but also the favorite uh, period of Agnese Manucci. Agnese was presenting a poster on um, Eocene outcrop from Israel, which was full of chert. And Agnese wanted to understand whether or not there was an orbital control on that occurrence of chert. Agnese, tell us all about it. I'm standing here with uh, Agnese Manucci. And he's got a post here uh, on astronomical age levels at the early Eocene. Could you introduce yourself? Okay, yeah. So I'm Agnese. I am on uh, my third year of my PhD. I'm working at Urbino University. And that's my first time at EGU. And I'm finally presenting part of my project. And I'm very excited to be here. And yeah, I loved the people that came to me. And I had a lot of nice inputs and a lot of excitement from other people, so it makes me even more happy to have a chance to work on this stuff. Oh, that's really wonderful. Um, that's always good to hear. So, could you explain a little bit more on what your poster was on and what you're presenting here? Okay, yeah. I'm presenting a work on a core that is from Israel, and those are ocean sediments from early Eocene. And the main idea was to do a cyclostrat analysis and build an age model so that we could identify the main hyperthermals there and that's the point we are at right now and the next step would be to see the relationship that there is uh, between the chert nodules that we find there and those kind of cycles that for sure are in the record and uh, another point of our project is to correlate what we have there in Israel with uh, what happens on the other side of the Tethys, so from some section from Italy, the Contessa Bottaccione section mainly. And at this point, we know that those chert nodules, they are almost simultaneous, but not really. On one side, they appear before ETM3, 
so a very famous cycle thermal for who doesn't know and on the other side they are after ECM3 so it really gets a little bit of perspective on the whole process of their formation and how they relate with the other cycles because and for now we don't really know that much about it. Oh brilliant that's uh, really fascinating uh, thanks for explaining um, and yeah, you mentioned this is your first EGU. So how have you how have you found it? Any highlights? Uh, the first day. <laughs> first of all, I think that it's amazing the way I found out about it because I start speaking about it with people I met at Utrecht University. Since I came from a very small university, it was amazing to have like this huge overview about what the real research environment is. So that was the first very good thing about my experience and. Yeah, it was, it's huge. So I was a little lost in the beginning, but, uh, there are so, so many different works by different people. And it's always, I would say, enlightening to, to find out how many questions you can ask yourself and see that there are people interested in answering them. Brilliant. Well, then, uh, thank you very much. And hopefully maybe see you next year at EGU 2024. And with that, we're at the end of this 14th episode of Cyclopod. It was really a lot of fun of making this episode because the five people we interviewed were all very eager to learn, enthusiastic about their science, and just willing to share their scientific results. So I want to express my thanks to the five early career PhD students that um, featured in this episode. But of course, I also want to thank you, listener, to listen to this 14th episode of Cyclopod. And at this point, I say, see you next time. Ciao.